Hi everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Human Physiology. Today we're going to start with Chapter 1, that's Introduction. We're going to cover uh, Introduction to Physiology, Levels of Organization, Characteristics of Life, and then we're going to cover the Homeostasis Model. Um, I'd like to focus on the Homeostasis Model. You should know this um, for exams and just in general of how the body regulates itself. As we go through the course, you will get better at uh, figuring out homeostasis and how the body regulates itself. Okay, so. All right, so here's a laser pointer. So anatomy and physiology affect your life every day. Anatomy is the oldest medical science. It was developed in 1600 BC in Rome. Um, anatomists used to wear rosemary around their neck. So they would tie a string of rosemary around their neck. And when they were studying the cadavers and the material, they would sniff the rosemary. Um, research shows they did research on essential oils probably about five or six years ago. And they found that rosemary, in fact, does uh, help with memory retrieval. So if you have some essential oils, rosemary is a good one to sniff while you're um, studying for this class. Uh, physiology is a study of function and involves a lot of basic uh, sciences. It involves physics, um, chemistry, uh, when you talk about blood flow and mechanics um, of uh, the heart pumping and the blood vessels and respiration. It involves biochemistry. So if you've taken biochemistry in the past, physiology and biochemistry are uh, very closely related um, in genetics and then cell and molecular biology. Anatomy investigates the structures of the body. So what are they made of? Uh, where are they located? And the associated structures around them. Physiology investigates the processes or functions of these living things. Um, we're interested in um, individual functions. So for example, uh, the heart or the lungs, and then we're interested in cooperative functions. So how does your cardiovascular system work? How does your respiratory system work? Or how does it work to keep you uh, in homeostasis or a healthy individual, right? Uh, let's get into the levels of organization. So the smallest level of organization is a chemical or molecular level. Atoms are the smallest chemical units and everything is made out of atoms, right? From chemistry, you know that an atom um, has a neutron and a proton uh, inside, unless you're talking about hydrogen, then it's just a proton. Um, and then the electrons orbit around there, right? Those are subatomic particles. So each atom is going to have subatomic particles and that atom, um, when we have elements, when we look at the periodic table, all of those elements, let's say oxygen, oxygen element is made out of oxygen atoms. Um, and then atoms combine to form molecules, and then molecules combine to form organelles. The cellular level is the smallest functional unit of an organism. So as biologists, we're interested in what is the smallest functional unit of this or that. And so you'll hear me talk about that as we get into some of the material. So the cell is the smallest functional unit of an organism. Um, cells limit uh, how big an organism can get or, um, you know, why don't we have big dragonflies zipping around like in prehistoric days? Um, because uh, the cell, uh, the size of the cell limits how big an organism can get. Um, also, the size of the cell limits how fast diffusion can occur. So um, if you have a lot of surface area, you're going to have a lot of diffusion. If you have a small amount of surface area, you're going to have less diffusion. So when we're talking about the body, the cells that have folds, like in the digestive tract, or the lungs or the brain um, are going to have a, a higher rate of uh, surface area to internal volume. And so you're going to have more diffusion. Um, all cells are similar in some ways, right? They all um, have some type of basic functioning like uh, metabolism or producing wastes. Um, cells are a group of atoms, molecules, and organelles working together to perform a function. Then we have the tissue level. So tissues are a group of similar cells working together to produce a common function. 
the four types of main tissues found in our body are epithelial tissues. Um, these cover the surfaces of the body and lines cavities. Muscle tissue provides a movement. Connective tissue connects tissues, supports and protects body organs, and the nervous tissue is for rapid communication. So these are the four types of tissues. Uh, you learned these in anatomy, and you learned examples of these in anatomy. So for example, uh, where do we find epithelial tissue? One of the major organs of our body, which is the skin, right? Um, you also find it in the digestive tract. So if we're talking about endothelial, tissue, which means it lines the inside of um, uh, body cavities or um, inside, let's say, the blood vessels, then it would be endothelial tissue. Um, muscle tissue, the three types of muscle, good, skeletal, smooth, and um, cardiac. And then connective tissue, there are multitudes of connective tissue. Um, if we're talking about tendons and ligaments, that's dense, regular connective tissue. If we're talking about body fat, that's adipose. The blood is connective tissue. Um, there's a bunch of different types of connective tissues. And then nervous tissue, which would be nerves, brain, spinal cord, et cetera. All right. Um, so let me back up a second. Let me ask you a question. So what is the lowest level of organization? Okay, good. So it would be the chemical or molecular level. Um, what is the smallest functional unit of an organism? Good, it would be the cellular level. So I expect you to know this on a basic level, right? This is just sort of introductory uh, information. So for levels of organization, um, the organ level then is an orient. Well, if we keep going, the organ level. Um, an organ is a group of different tissues working together, composed of at least two tissue types, or usually four, right? So if we think of, go back to the heart, uh, what kind of tissue do we find in the heart? Do we find epithelial or endothelial? Yeah, we do, right? So endothelial lining for that heart is uh, simple squamous endothelial lining, and the same with the outside. Uh, do we find connective tissue? Yes, we do. We find a real or connective tissue, right? And um, that is found in the pericardial, uh, uh, sorry, the visceral pericardium and then the parietal pericardium or the, the pericardial sac. Um, what else is in the heart? Um, do we have uh, muscle? Good, so we have cardiac muscle. Do we have nervous tissue inside that heart? Okay, technically no. Um, you do have excitable cells inside that heart, but those are modified cardiac cells. So we don't have nervous tissue inside the heart. We have nerves synapsing with the heart for regulation. Okay, so that's how we decide if something's an organ. Is it, is it comprised of two or more tissue types? Okay, the organ system level is a group of organs working together to perform a certain function. Humans have 11 organ systems. Uh, the biggest one would be skin, right? And I'm sure you can name the other ones um, that you should have learned in anatomy, so we're not gonna cover that. Um, and then the organism level, this is us, right? So the organism level is comprised of all structural units working together to maintain homeostasis, and keep us alive. Okay, the next topic is characteristics of life. How do we determine if something is living or not? Um, living things display certain characteristics, so they maintain boundaries inside and outside of them, um, whether or not it's inside or outside um, from their person or inside or outside of the cells. So for example, for us, our integumentary system maintains a boundary uh, of our inside environment compared to outside. Um, the outside environment, and then our cell membranes regulate what, come in, what comes in and out of our cells. Okay, so here's a little uh, amoeba that's um, displaying movement. So all living things display movement. Uh, for us, it's, you know, muscles and circulation of body fluids. For plants, they don't get up and walk around, right? But they actually will move in response to that sunlight. So they do move. Um, they display responsiveness. So they sense changes in their environment and respond. So withdrawal reflexes or homeostatic feedback mechanisms for us. Um, most living things have the ability to withdraw. Um, 
or sense uh, something going on and respond accordingly. All living things have to have digestion, so they have to have a way to break down and absorb nutrients. Um, for us, it's our GI tract, and then we pull it into the blood. Um, this would be a white blood cell attacking bacteria, and so this would be an example of responsiveness. All living things whoops, display metabolism. Metabolism is all the chemical reactions that occur in our cells. We'll cover catabolism and anabolism uh, when we get into metabolism. Um, cellular respiration or metabolism. So metabolism at the cellular level is production of ATP for work. Um, this is regulated by hormones and by your brain. They have to have a way to excrete wastes, right? So CO2 is a waste product urea, creatinine, um, when we take in food source, fiber is a waste product. Um, when uh, single-celled organisms such as the amoeba or uh, bacteria take in uh, food sources, they have to have a way to get rid of them, so they excrete waste products into the environment. Um, they have to have a way for reproduction. So cellular reproduction, the cell is going to divide into two identical daughter cells, for growth and repair, right? So if you're scratching your skin, you have to have a way to repair that barrier. So you're constantly going through um, cell division or mitosis to make more cells or regenerate those cells. And this is a picture on the right-hand side of, my, of mitosis. Um, organismal reproduction, so produces a new individual through sexual reproduction. So that's also a way uh, that we reproduce. Um, and then growth. Growth would be increase in size, of a cell or number of cells. What do we need for our survival? So all living things need nutrients. Um, not all living things need oxygen, but we need oxygen. So some bacteria uh, do not need oxygen to go through metabolism. Uh, we need water. Not all living things. Again, there are some bacteria that don't need water. Uh, we need normal body temperature and appropriate atmospheric pressure. Okay, so this is the one that I want to spend some time on. Um, I want you to know this. I want you to know what homeostasis means. I want you to know um, the homeostatic feedback loop, the definitions for each of the steps, generic definitions, and then I want you to be able to do the homeostatic feedback loop for body temperature and for blood sugar regulation, um, for high blood sugar specifically. This will be tested on in lecture. Um, we will have different homeostatic feedback loops you'll see in lab um, that you're going to be doing that I will test you on in lab. Um, you need to spend some time on this. You need to uh, take a piece of paper or um, whatever, you know, your laptop and draw it out and uh, keep drawing it out until you actually uh, have memorized it and understand it and you can work through it. All right, so homeostasis, what does it mean? It means unchanging. It means to maintain a relatively stable internal environment regardless of what's going on outside. Um, it allows change within narrow limits. It's called a dynamic equilibrium. And so, for example, um, what happens if your body temperature goes up, right? So let's say I go from the air conditioning house out into, you know, 100 degree weather. What happens to my body temperature? My body temperature is going to go up. Um, and so then my body is going to ultimately bring it back down. Um, if I'm going out in the cold uh, from leaving the house in the winter time, you know, body temperature is going to drop and my body is going to bring it back up, right? Can you think of other examples besides body temperature? So body temperature is the easiest one because it's one that we're already familiar with. All right, so blood sugar was already said. Can you think of anything else? Okay, heart rate, blood pressure, right? Um, respiratory rate, uh, blood pH, um, blood particle concentration, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, mechanisms of regulation. So there are two different ways you can regulate homeostasis. You can regulate homeostasis um, intrinsically within the cell tissue or organ. Um, it's an automatic response, so this organ or cell or tissue will sense what's going on and then make a change. Um, you see this with the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland and parathyroid gland measure 
uh, blood calcium levels and um, they do it uh, automatically. Then there's actually extrinsic regulation. Most responses that we're gonna look at, in fact, all of them, are um, responses controlled by nervous and endocrine system. Excuse me. So if blood pressure goes up, your nervous system is gonna bring it back down. If blood pressure drops, your nervous system is gonna bring it back up. Um, nervous system is a really fast regulation of uh, homeostasis. Um, it occurs within nanoseconds to milliseconds. Uh, endocrine system is your backup mechanism. It's sort of like the second tier. Um, if your nervous system can't regulate blood pressure, then your endocrine system is going to uh, regulate it for nervous system. All homeostatic feedback loops have the same steps. They all have a stimulus. They all have a sensor. They have an integrator, an effector, a response, and a result, right? Um, and so how do I memorize Let's see, how do I memorize the steps? I think of um, students, and students have told me this. So think of S, S, I, E, R, R, right? Stimulus, sensor, integrator, effector, response, and result. And that will give you the sequence of steps. Um, let's get into what the stimulus is. So let me change this back. The stimulus is any deviation from the set point, right? And so um, let's, so for example, let's do body temperature. Um, what is your set point for body temperature? Okay, so we all know it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, is everyone's body temperature the same? So if I took everyone's body temperature, would it be 98.6? No. Okay, so you have your inherent set point for your own self. Um, and then humans as a species have their own set point as well, okay? Um, we know that it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Literature, recent literature shows that it's a little bit lower. So around 97.4, what have you. But um, the stimulus then would be any deviation from this, all right? And so let's say my set point is 98.6. So my stimulus, let's say, would be an increase in body temperature. Let's say I went outside and it's hot out in the summertime. It would be an increase in body temperature. All right, now let me be clear. This is where I need you to pay attention. Um, this error is measured by the sensor. Um, when you think of error, I want you to think of physiological error or physiological deviation, okay? It's not wrong. It's just deviation from the set point, right? So keep in mind when I ask you to provide me examples of error, I'm not talking about the experiment was wrong or um, you know this didn't work or what have you. I want to know physiological normal variation. Um, the sensor is a receptor that senses change in the stimulus. Um, when you are trying to figure out the sensors, you need to ID the sensor, whether it's, you know, a thermal receptor or a chemoreceptor, and give me the location. Where are they found? You have to have both components for the sensor. An integrator. What is an integrator? An integrator um, compares the signal coming in to a set point. Um, the integrator is usually a part of the brain. It's usually the hypothalamus or the pos, uh, excuse me, the hypothalamus or the medulla oblongata. So for body temperature, let's say body temperature is too high, the sensor is gonna send that stimulus information to the integrator. The integrator is gonna get that signal, it's gonna compare it to an inherent set point. So the medulla oblongata, or excuse me, the hypothalamus would compare a body temperature coming in too high to the set point and then uh, send a signal out to exact some type of change. So the hypothalamus is gonna send a signal out um, to the effector, effectors, and the effectors are going to cause some type of a response to bring body temperature down. So the effector in this situation, or generally speaking, is an organ or a tissue. So um, an effector is gonna be an organ or some type of tissue. In this case, it's gonna be the skin, um, blood vessels and suck glands. And then the response is gonna be that the blood vessels dilate, right, to dump heat from um, your skin to the environment, and then the um, 
So our glands are going to increase sweat production, and then the result would be a drop in body temperature. Negative feedback loops are called negative feedback loops because by the time you go through the process, the result is the exact opposite of the stimulus. So let me give you an example. If body temperature is high, by the time you go through this feedback loop, body temperature should have dropped, right? Or if body temperature is low, by the time you go through this, body temperature should have gone up. This is called a negative feedback loop. Um, what is a positive feedback loop? A positive feedback loop is where the result is an amplification of the stimulus. Um, you see this with blood clotting, right? So blood clotting, uh, you turn on one factor, then that activates another factor, another factor, another factor. Um, childbirth is another one. So contractions cause oxytocin release, more contractions, more oxytocin, more contractions, more oxytocin until the baby is born. Um, there are very rare, or there are not very many uh, positive feedback loops in the body. Most of them and all of them that we're going to be talking about, exception of blood clotting, are negative. So most of the feedback loops in our body are negative. Okay, so negative common reverses change results in fluctuations about the set point. Um, body temperature is one. Positive feedback systems are rare. It's where the change is amplified. For example, blood clotting. Um, blood clotting proteins give you more blood clotting proteins, activates more and more and more. It's this whole cascade mechanism. All right, so the set point is the ideal normal value of a variable. So what is your body's temperature set point? Good, it's around 98.6. Okay, it might be different for each other or everybody in the class. Um, error values are values that are still normal values, but they are not the set point. So there is a normal range of values or error or physiological error or physiological variation for any homeostatic feedback system in the body. Um, can you give me some error values for body temperature? All right, 98.9, right? 98.0, 97.9. Do you know a normal range for body temperature? So around 97.9 to 99.0, uh, right? Low grade fever is above 99.1. High grade fever above 200, or excuse me, 102 degrees Fahrenheit. So moving forward in this class, I want you to know normal ranges. I want you to know the set point of whatever we're talking about. Um, and I want you to know how your body is going to handle that deviation. Okay, so let's go over an, a relatively easy one. This is a negative homeostatic feedback mechanism involving the brain with temperature regulation. Okay, so the stimulus would be an increase in body temperature, right? And then the sensor, remember, you're going to give me a receptor in a location. So we're going to say uh, thermal receptors in the skin and hypothalamus, right? You have two sets of them. You have one in the skin, or you have several of them in the skin, and then uh, some of them in the hypothalamus. So these guys are constantly, not like every hour or what have you, but constantly measuring body temperature. So they're constantly evaluating what's going on. How is body temperature changing? And they are coding that information in the form of action potentials and sending that to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is the integrator in this process. The hypothalamus measures the incoming signal to a set point and says, hey, body temperature is too high. My body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I need to bring it down, or um, that's my set point. My body temperature is 99.2 degrees Fahrenheit. I need to bring it back down. Um, and also, as you're going through stuff, don't forget the units, right? Know that it's degrees Fahrenheit. Know that heart rate is beats per minute. Respiratory rate is breaths per minute. Um, the hypothalamus is then going to send a nervous signal out to your skin, blood vessels, and sweat glands. We're not concerned about the nerve, uh, the name of the nerve, or um, that it's an efferent nerve system, or it's a motor nerve. Uh, you have learned a lot of those in uh, anatomy. And so we'll bring them in as appropriate, but not right now. The hypothalamus is going to go to the blood vessels of the skin and the sweat glands, and it's going to cause the blood vessels to do what? 
good, they're gonna dilate. What are those spectrums gonna do? Increase sweat production, okay? So the response is that they dilate and release heat from surface, and then the sweat glands in the skin release heat as well. By the time you've done this, you should have a decrease in body temperature. If it's not low enough, then this uh, negative feedback loop is just gonna keep going until you hit your desired set point. Okay, um, disturbance of homeostasis. So physiological systems work to restore balance. If your body is damaged, like let's say you just had surgery or you had an injury, um, your body is gonna go back to healthy. Um, you, your body has this ability to heal wounds um, and uh, go back to physiological normal for your body. Um, a disturbance is a failure to maintain homeostasis um, that results in disease or death, right? So if you have a disturbance uh, or sometimes called a disruption, you can't get body back to the set point, right? So can you think of a disturbance for body temperature? Okay, so let's say um, I'm out hiking in Joshua Tree in summer and I didn't bring water. What's gonna happen to my body temperature? Good, it's gonna go up. It's gonna keep creeping up. Um, and then my hypothalamus is gonna try to regulate it and I'm gonna sweat. Um, but eventually I'm gonna get dehydrated and I'm not gonna be able to sweat as effectively, right? And so blood pressure drops because I've been losing all the water to the environment. And eventually I'm gonna start going into uh, heat exhaustion and then heat stroke. And so heat exhaustion and heat stroke would be considered a disturbance. So your body, as you um, get more and more dehydrated, you lose that ability to regulate body temperature. The hypothalamus shuts down. Um, can you think one on the flip side? What about um, if you fall into a frozen lake? Good, hypothermia. So you're losing heat faster than you can generate it. And so that's another disturbance for body temperature. Um, can you think of a disturbance for respiratory rate? Can you think of a disturbance for um, heart rate or blood pressure? Okay, so a disturbance means simply that you can't get back to set point, right? Um, so if body temperature is high and you are going through disturbance, you can't get it back down. All right, the next example does not involve the brain. So this is an endocrine example, example, excuse me, um, and it's a blood glucose regulation and it doesn't involve the brain. Um, so blood glucose, what do we use glucose for? Uh, normal blood glucose range is 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter or 100 mils of blood. Um, this is non-fasting, so 60 to 100 milligrams per deciliter for fasting. What do we use it for? We pull it into our cells and we make a lot of ATP. Um, our brain does not store sugar to function, so we have to have glucose in the blood for our brain to take it. Uh, what regulates it? So here's your pancreas. Do you guys remember where your pancreas is? Good, it's below your stomach or just posterior to the stomach. Um, the pancreas, there are little islands in there called the islets of Langerhans. And these islands or islets of Langerhans actually make uh, or regulate blood sugar. So they have alpha and beta cells that regulate blood sugar. The rest of this is digestive functioning. So the pancreas has digestive functioning, um, which is secreting digestive enzymes and increasing the pH of the duodenum fluid. Um, so it's not so acidic. And then the pancreas has endocrine functioning, which is regulating blood pressure, or excuse me, uh, blood um, glucose. Sorry, I'm still, we just finished like two weeks ago. So I'm in still at the end of the semester mode. <laughs> um, blood glucose homeostasis. So blood glucose increases. Let's say you eat a meal. Blood glucose increases to 120 milligrams per deciliter. Um, the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans, so the beta cells in here, are going to sense that high blood sugar. They're going to release insulin into the bloodstream. Make sure you indicate the hormone. Um, that insulin is going to bind to body cells. So you have receptors called glute receptors that bind insulin. So insulin is going to bind to the body cells, to adipose, to liver, and skeletal muscle. And when the insulin sits on those receptors, it's going to cause the cells to take up the glucose, right? So the glucose is going to go from the bloodstream 
into those cells. Um, and so the cells are going to uptake the glucose. The adipocytes are going to uptake glucose and convert it to fat. And then liver and skeletal muscle uptake glucose and convert it to glycogen, right? And so um, your cells will basically take whatever glucose they need, whatever is um, whatever your liver and skeletal muscle need, they're going to pull in and convert it to glycogen for storage for later. Um, your liver actually stores glucose to regulate blood sugar, uh, but we'll talk about that when we get to endocrine. And then your dipocytes are going to take up glucose and convert it to fat. And so by then, blood glucose should drop back down to normal. Um, what would be a disturbance? So a disturbance uh, is when blood sugar is high and you can't bring it back down, right? So blood sugar is high and you can't bring it back down. What do we call that disturbance? Good, it has a name. So it's diabetes mellitus, okay? So diabetes mellitus is a disturbance because you can't bring blood sugar back down. It stays high. So regardless if blood sugar is high, it doesn't matter. You still can't regulate it. Um, you can't bring it back down to set point because either your pancreas isn't releasing enough insulin, that's diabetes mellitus type 1, or your pancreas is releasing insulin. It's just not effective to binding to the cells. And so those glute receptors after day in and day out of being stimulated, you know, by simple carbs, um, these guys become resistant and they don't open in response to insulin. And so regardless, blood sugar stays high. So disturbance uh, prevents the homeostatic feedback loop from going back to some point. So blood sugar is going to stay high. Um, if somebody has regulated diabetes mellitus, blood sugar is still going to be slightly higher than normal. So for example, my father has diabetes mellitus, but he doesn't have to take meds for it. Um, blood sugar for him, normal is 150 milligrams per deciliter. Um, that would be high for a healthy, normal individual, but because he has diabetes mellitus, it's always going to be slightly elevated. Um, but that is really good if you have diabetes mellitus. Okay, so um, start drawing those out and going over that. Um, and then get into the lab. For lab, um, you're going to look at homeostatic feedback loops, and then we're going to go over graphing. And so I um, will do that video next. Thank you.